Okay, so I'm Travis Brown. Um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, so Vladimir just gave us a history of Finch. I'm going to be talking about the, some, a couple of the directions that Finch is going, um, uh, specifically in terms of integration with these two uh, third-party libraries, Shapeless and Cats. Um, the Cats integration is still something that's on the table. It's not definite, um, but the Shapeless integration is already in um, uh, the master branch on GitHub, and it will be available in the Finch 07 release. So um, first of all, how many people, could I just see a show of hands, how many people have used Shapeless before? Or, okay, wow. So, so almost uh, probably a third to half of the room has, that, that's, that's um, more people than I expected. So I, I will give a kind of introduction to Shapeless first and talk, um, and, and some motivation for why we would, why we want to use it in Finch. Um, okay, so Shapeless is a library for generic programming in Scala. Um, and what that means is um, that it provides us a bunch of, of abstractions and, and um, generic operations uh, for things like, like tuples. So how many people have um, at some point, really wish that Scala gave you a way to take two tuples and combine them into a bigger tuple. Okay, so a lot of people. This is something that that's, it's, it's, it feels like a piece that's possibly missing from the Scala standard library. Um, another, another issue is um, uh, Shapeless gives you abstraction over functionality. So basically, any time um, you have these, these like tuple one, tuple two, tuple three, tuple four, or function one, function two, function three, function four in the standard library. The standard library isn't going to help you abstract over that tuple in part, um, but shapeless does. Okay, another thing, um, this, is the, this is mostly new uh, in the boilerplate freeway in Shapeless 2, but Shapeless gives you facilities for abstracting over case classes. So I'll show an example of what that looks like in just a minute. In the same way, it, it gives you a way of mapping really cleanly between um, case classes and tuples. Okay, and it also has a lot of other really useful things. So you can kind of think about it as like the opposite of juice. So in Shapeless, we're trying to take everything we can and encode it in the type system so that the Scala compiler is helping us make sure that our program is correct before we ever run our program. Okay, so things like statically sized collections and um, type level natural numbers. Okay, so here's, this is all you need to do if you have a shapeless dependency to add two tuples together. Is that big enough to see? Okay, okay. So what we've done here is um, we've got a tuple of a symbol and a string and then a tuple of some numbers. Um, we use this plus plus operator that Shapeless provides and we get a tuple of five things. And you'll see that um, in the, the REPL here, the static type of the result is exactly what we want. This is entirely type safe. Um, we, we're not going to ever get any kind of runtime error um, working with these operators. Okay, so that's a very simple example. That's, a, that's just one nice operator that, that Shapeless provides. This is a more complex example where I'm trying to do something um, that at, at first it might seem like it would just take an enormous amount of, um, of uh, boilerplate. But so I've got these two case classes right here and they have, they have members that have the same types and the same names, but they're in different orders. And so I'd like to write a generic method for taking any two case classes um, that have the same member names and same member types in different orders and convert them between each other. And this is all the code that I need to do that. So it looks kind of messy, like it's intimidating, and there's a bunch of uh, type class instances there, but that's all the code that you need to convert any um, two case classes that share these properties between each other. So it's a really powerful operation um, that we're able to do very concisely because we've got these uh, these powerful type classes. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you could do uh, with a macro. So I could write a macro pretty easily. It would be maybe 40 lines of code or so that would take um, any two case classes that share these properties and, con and provide converters between them. Um, but uh, it's really nice if you can to, um, uh, to avoid writing these kinds of one-off macros. So, 
the idea behind um, these operations in Shapeless is that it's let somebody else write the macros for you and let them make sure that they're minimal, um, that they're going to be well maintained and um, that they're well tested. But it's not something that you um, have to have in many cases in your own code base. And Shapeless gives you a way um, to uh, use the power of macros but not have them in your own code base. OK, um, so also I've been using Shapeless for a few years, and there's just a lot of really fun stuff that you can do with it. So here I've got um, links to a, uh, a solution of the Tower of Hanoi, Towers of Hanoi problem at the type level, where when you compile your program, you specify the problem instance, um, and the compiler will actually solve the problem and print it out while it's compiling your program. So it's, it's frivolous, it doesn't mean anything, but it's kind of cool that you can make the Scala compiler actually solve this kind of problem at compile time. Okay, um, so, but Shapeless isn't just a toy, so there are lots and lots of, um, of really important uses of Shapeless. So uh, the specs library, for example, in specs two um, is using it in the given and win combinators. Uh, Spray is using it for its routers. And then S codec. Has anybody used S codec before? Okay. So S codec is by far, in my opinion, the best um, library in Scala for doing binary serialization. It's just, it's really amazing, really beautiful. Um, encourage you to take a look. Okay. And then Parboiled is a um, uh, parsing co parser combinator library that is, um, it's, much, it's much more oriented towards performance than the parser combinators in the standard library. OK. So before I move on to how we're using Shapeless in Finch, I want to give a really quick introduction to CATS. So who has heard about the CATS project in Scala? Wow. Again, a lot more people than I would have expected. Um, so CATS is only three months old. So it started at, at the very end of January or the very beginning of February. Um, but the idea behind CATS is that it's a, it's a library for functional programming abstractions in Scala. Um, what other library does this sound like? OK, yeah, it, it, it sounds a lot like Scala Z. And um, uh, CATS is, in a lot of ways, a direct descendant of Scala Z. Uh, there are a few differences in terms of emphasis. So um, CATS is built on a couple of different compiler and build system plugins like um, Simulacrum and Machinist um, and uh, uh, another one called um, Kind Projector that allow you to make the code base a lot cleaner. So the CATS code base, the goal is um, as little boilerplate as possible through the use of these uh, compiler and build system plugins. I mean, it's also, there's more of a focus on performance in CATS. So it's still very young, but this is something that is more explicitly a goal of the CATS project than it's ever been for Scala Z. Um, it's, it's more willing to, um, so it's not trying to be Haskell in Scala. It's trying to provide functional, um, functional abstractions in Scala, and it, it's more willing at least um, to make compromises when necessary to provide um, these, this as a Scala library, not as an attempt to turn Scala into something else. OK. So <clears throat> yeah, and it's still very, very young. OK, so because it is very, very young, um, it's still, this is still, so the shapeless stuff is already in Finch. The cat stuff is, um, it's possibly on the table for uh, Finch 1.0, but it might um, appear in Finch after 1.0, um, depending on what, how, how quickly cat's development moves along. Um, but the idea is that there are lots and lots of functional programming abstractions that we're using in Finch, um, like the reader monad, like um, the validation type, which is like either, except it allows you to accumulate errors on the left side, um, and then things like monoid. Like the, it's, it's nice to have representations of these things. So the Scala standard library doesn't give you representations of monads or applicative functors or functors, even though it, it kind of has them um, built into its syntactic sugar. And CATS provides you with explicit representations of all those things. So it's nice to have these things. It would be nice not to have to um, rewrite them from scratch in Finch, which is 
um, more or less what we're currently doing. OK, so for both of these libraries, Shapeless and Cats, the kind of big picture motivation is let's clean up Finch by, um, instead of uh, rebuilding these abstractions inside of Finch for ourselves, let's um, bring, them in, uh, bring that functionality in through these, these well-tested, well-maintained third-party libraries. Um, also, let's, let's do away with all of the um, arity-based boilerplate. So every time we've got some kind of function that we have to write 22 times because we need to cover all 22 function ends or tuple ends, let's get rid of all of that. Um, also, let's um, uh, provide more type safety where we can and actually, instead of um, using integration with these libraries, letting it uh, be something that makes our APIs more complex. Um, let's let's um, take it as an opportunity to make our APIs more elegant. Okay, so um, the links are here. It's pretty easy if you Google Shapeless Scholar or Cat Scholar as well, you'll come across, across these projects. But I encourage you to take a look at them. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to focus on um, this, this request reader um, type in, in, in Finch because it's, it's pretty easy to wrap your head around what it does. So it, it takes a, um, an HTTP request coming in um, and it, it parses some information out of that request like um, query parameters or, what, or the body or whatever you need and gives you some, some new type. So the request, and that new type is returned in a future, so you can potentially fail, um, and it might, it might take a while. All that's modeled in the type system. Um, so it's, uh, when we have something that is a request reader user here, what that actually is is a wrapper around a function from an HTTP request to uh, a user inside of a future. And um, this is, so, in uh, Finch 06, this is what it looks like to write a request reader for a, um, for a case class. So it's actually, it's really elegant. It, it's, it's a nice, very simple API where what we're doing is saying um, we want to take a qu an ID query parameter, um, uh, parse it as a long, and then compose it with a, um, a name parameter, and then pipe those both into our user type. So, it's, it's very nice, um, but it does have a few drawbacks. So uh, one of the drawbacks is that this, this tilde here is actually a case class. And um, that's something that, that it's, it's a very generic thing, um, but it's something that we have to maintain. And there are a lot of operations that are a handful of operations that go along with it that are part of the Finch code base that are super generic, that um, there's no particular reason that they need to live inside of Finch. Um, it's got, I'm going to take a risk and click a link here. This is an example of what the Arity, um, the Arity boilerplate looks like. We have to, if we want that nice little tilde arrow operator, we've got to write all of this boilerplate code. Um, it's just a mess. You can actually have the, uh, we could have this done inside of, um, like as something that's run at, uh, at the uh, compile time by the build system, but it, either way, it's a, it's a pain to have to maintain this kind of boilerplate. OK. And the, the case class support is fairly limited. So in that example, we were seeing the tilde arrow go into the user. All that was happening there is we were piping it into the user.apply um, method. OK, so this is the new, I think this landed two days ago in master, a couple of days ago. So this is the new shapeless um, style uh, way of doing exactly the same thing. So here again, uh, we've got that user case class, and we're, um, we, we have a prem of ID in exactly the same way we parse it into a long, and then we compose it, not using a tilde, but using this, this colon colon, and then um, we, instead of piping it with the, with the tilde arrow, we just say we want to use this as a user. Um, so it's, it's very, very similar in terms of the syntax, but um, we've done away with a lot of the specific, a lot of the, the types in Finch that don't need to actually live in Finch. So instead of our tilde type, our tilde case class, we're using uh, shapeless as hlist. 
all of that arity boilerplate just goes away. We can, um, we can write those, those tilde uh, operators using shapeless's abstraction over function arity. Um, and we get much nicer uh, case class support. So this is an example of what that much nicer case class support looks like. So what's happening here is that we don't even have to specify. So in those previous examples, we had to say we want to read a, um, a, a parameter named with the key ID out of our query string. In this case, um, we're going to let the compiler figure out that this case class has two members named ID and um, name and actually um, find those, those um, keys in the query string. So it's just, we, don't, we have to write basically nothing. And the nice thing too is that if we change our user um, case class, we don't have to worry about updating it here as well. So this is actually, it looks very, very simple, but what's happening behind the scenes is pretty complicated um, because, so first, um, the macro has to analyze the case class and say, okay, the case class has members with these field names and these field types. And then um, we have to create uh, param readers for each of those, um, those name type pairs. And then we have to be sure that for each of those types, we have um, decode result instances in scope so that we actually know how to parse that query parameter into whatever type we need for our case class. Um, and uh, we, then we compose all of these pieces into a request reader. So without writing a single new macro, we're doing all of that at compile time in this one line of code. Um, so it's completely type safe. If for some reason like our user has some, kind of, um, has some kind of member of a type that we don't know how to parse out of a query string parameter, um, we'll get a failure at compile time, not at runtime. Okay, and this is not quite in, um, in shapeless yet. We're trying to figure out, so I don't really like this API. It's kind of necessary to this, this dot to dot from params. It's necessary to work around the fact that we can't partially apply type parameters in Scala, but it's not too bad. And it, it gives us a way to say um, like uh, request re reader to user from body or from some other piece of the HTTP request. Okay, so we went through this already. Okay, any questions about, sha about Shapeless and Finch before we move on to cats? If we have time, we can look in a little bit more detail at how that's actually implemented. But the nice thing is it's very, very little code. So we've taken a lot of code out of Finch and we've, put in, we've added a new dependency, um, but it's a dependency that we trust and um, we've, we've uh, basically, it's a net um, deletion of a ton of code. Okay. So I'm going to again focus on um, the request reader because it is this nice, simple type. And in the same way that we provided nicer ways of composing and building up request readers using shapeless, here I'm going to look at how we can actually throw out our request reader type entirely. Um, so there is no more request reader in um, Finch after this change, which is much, much further in the future, um, will just be a type alias. It won't even, there won't be a request reader class in Finch. Um, so as Vladimir mentioned, uh, uh, this, so the, the P in front of here, um, this is a slightly more uh, generic version of the, of the um, request reader where it can take any kind of input, not just an HTTP request. And um, in this form, uh, this is basically a function from some fixed type A to uh, some type inside of a future. And then when we take off the P, that's a type alias in the current version of Finch for the same thing, but we fix that first, we fix that input type to HTTP request. And um, this is called, this is called um, in the kind of functional programming literature, a reader monad. Um, and there's a good discussion on the, on the Finch website by Vladimir of what that means with some, some links to other resources. So if this is a term that you've never seen before, um, I'd encourage you to take a look at, follow this link and take a look at the, the resources there. 
OK, yeah, so this is just a, a wrapper for um, a, a function a to uh, some, some future type. Yes? So does that mean that a monad is just a translator from some I.O. to um, So this is actually a very specific kind of monad. Um, so like list is a monad, for example, and list doesn't really have that shape at all. Um, so what this means is that this, this, so Vladimir showed earlier the kind of nice four comprehensions for building up your request readers, where you have four, and then you pull out like one, one of the query parameters by name, and then you pull out the body by name, and then you, you compose it using this four comprehension. And that four comprehension we can do because um, request reader is a monad. So that's basically all it means. It's going to desugar two calls to flat map and map behind the scenes. Um, yeah, so, so this, this specific shape, is, it's an example of, of a monad. It's not what makes a monad. Yeah, good question, though. Um, other questions before we go on? OK. So um, I, this is a little bit confusing, and I wish that, there were, that the terminology was standardized here. But um, so, so a reader monad um, where you have this kind of type constructor in the return type. So a reader monad is just a wrapper for a function. Um, but a reader monad where you have a type constructor around the return type. So we've got like A into future um, B or A into list B. Um, that's also called a Kleisley arrow. And um, so what we can say is that our, reader requ our request reader in Finch is just a Kleisley arrow over future. Um, just being kind of hand wavy. Um, but the thing is that there's a really nice um, implementation of Kleisley arrows in cats. So um, it, you can see here, it's a little small, uh, that this is just a case class that wraps a function from A to F of B. So this, this class looks very, very, very similar to the definition of request reader in, um, in Finch. So what we've done is we fix that f to be future, but otherwise this class looks very similar. Um, the map method is almost exactly the same. The flat map's almost exactly the same. Um, the, uh, there are some other combinators that have different names in Finch, but they have almost exact equivalents in um, the CATS implementation. So that's an opportunity. That's a place where we can make Finch smaller by um, bringing in this functionality from this library. OK. So um, this is a, a brand new experiment. And this is something that there's no guarantee that we'll, it will ever actually make it into um, cats. But it's something that we're very interested in and that um, we think has a lot of promise, where I've got a branch um, in my fork of cats where I've torn out um, uh, request reader and p request reader entirely and replaced them with the um, yeah, so here, here's request reader just going away. So um, there's no more request reader class in Finch. Instead, request reader is just a type alias for, um, for Kleisley in cats. So this is pretty cool. We can get rid of a lot of code. We don't have to implement our own map, our own flat map, our own embed flat map. All of these combinators that are really useful, um, we can let somebody else test, somebody else implement, somebody else maintain. Okay. So yeah, I already mentioned these parts. Um, in some places, the, the API in Finch, when this happens eventually, will have to change. Or we could provide aliases. But this is actually, I think, a really good thing because um, it standardizes the terminology in the community. So anybody who's using Finch, um, uh, who also is using cats or has seen cats before, will know, oh, I've got this function that I want to use on my request reader that takes an A and maps it into a future instead of into another um, request reader, that function is going to be called flat map k. It's not going to be called regular flat map. So it's nice that we have an embed flat map in Finch right now, but if we can use the standard terminology that's going to be familiar to the community, it's even nicer. OK. Um, some other stuff, this is, uh, some of this is more minor, but um, so right now there's a, there's a custom uh, to future method that is um, enriched onto any, any type you want. Um, 
we threw an implicit conversion in, in Finch. Um, that goes away. We've already got that in, uh, in cats. Um, we also have these things like, um, so, so is, are people familiar with the idea of applicative, um, applicative validation for error accumulation? How many people have seen this before or heard this? Okay, okay. Um, so basically what this means is we've got a bunch of operations that can fail and we want to run those operations in parallel and collect the failures instead of just having the entire computation fail with a single failure. Um, we're doing that in Finch um, in a way that works and it's nice, but it's, it's ad hoc compared to if we were using validation or validated from cats. Okay, there's lots of this stuff. Uh, so this, this is another, um, this is a brand new project that I started one night last week because I was, I was playing around with this, um, with using cats in Finch and I realized that a lot of the stuff I was writing was not specific to Finch. So I factored out, um, uh, like, the, like we really need a monad instance for future. Uh, why does that need to live in Finch? So that's moved into this project that's currently um, in my own GitHub repository but it'll probably move to the Finagle organization or somewhere else at some point um, called Catbird. So this provides things like, um, like bijections between Finagle services and Kleisley arrows, provides monad instances and other things for future and other types. So eventually, um, none of this is set in stone yet, but the idea is that this, this or some, something like this, this is very experimental at this point, would provide these kind of fundamental instances for um, Twitter util, for Finagle, um, and then Finch would build on top of that. Okay. So um, the advantages of both of these, the current integration with Shapeless and the integration with Cats is um, less code, uh, we share types and names with the community. So if somebody else has written, um, uh, written some kind of operation that works on Kleisley arrows, they can just plug a request reader into it and it will do exactly what they expect. And when they're reading the Finch code, if they see, um, if they see these operator names, they'll know exactly what they do because they're the same library. Um, so those are two of the advantages. And one of the really nice things is that um, if you do the API design right, the changes are pretty minimal. So we no longer have the tilde, um, tilde arrow stuff, but the semicolon is almost identical. It's basically a mechanical transformation. Um, and in the case of request reader, uh, the, the actual changes to user code will be even smaller. Um, so for the most part, that we're, not, we're using these libraries that are built on complex ideas and complex implementations and complex um, macros in some cases, but we're, we're not forcing that complexity on the user of Finch. Okay, um, so how much for time? Um, so there's some things that we wanna wrap up for the current uh, shapeless pieces in Finch, like uh, that, that kind of full derivation of request readers from case classes without any input from the user in terms of naming parameters, stuff like that. That needs to be more generic where we can not actually pull things in from the body, where we can make things optional. Um, that's going to happen in that pull request that I linked earlier. Um, this is still something that we're working out exactly what it should look like, uh, but the, the idea that Vladimir mentioned of um, heterogeneous routers, where you have a router that's composed of differently typed routers and then you use shapeless to prove things about the types um, for each of those components. Um, that's something that I'm hoping to have some time uh, to get a, a good draft for review done this weekend. Um, and then, uh, so Argonaut shapeless is a, um, so Argonaut is the currently suggested um, like default uh, JSON library in Finch. You can definitely use it. It's, um, with Jackson as well, but when you just fire up the Finch console from scratch, you're going to get Argonaut included there. Um, and there's a nice Argonaut shapeless library that um, would let us show off even more of the power of shapeless here. Uh, so those are a few of the next steps. And then um, we need to con continue thinking about whether it makes sense given the development of cats to 
um, to bring in CATS integration as well. And that's something that um, will be, will be Probably I'll, be, I'll continue development in a, in a separate CATS branch and try to keep it as closely in sync with, um, with Finch Master as I can over the next few months, possibly. Okay, so can anybody guess what some of the concerns uh, would be? Yes? The errors you get when things don't compile. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so I, Shapeless is likely to be a little better at this because Shapeless is on a, on a 2.0 version at this point, and a lot of attention has been put into um, trying to make the errors intelligible. Uh, but yeah, that's definitely a concern. Um, other stuff. Yeah. Right, uh, right. They're no longer HTTP yeah. oriented and they're now generic. Right. I think that this is a, re this is a really good point. That the, the idea is that if I'm just sitting down and writing a, um, a set of services and routers for those services, um, I, I have an API that looks like the API is before Shapeless, or it's very, very similar. But as soon as I need to go in and actually look at what the code looks like, um, it's going to be um, potentially really intimidating. And so, um, yeah, I think that that's definitely the fact that um, we're using, like the code base underneath the, the API is going to stay as consistent as we can as we add shapeless integration, as we, at some point we possibly um, bring in cats types. Um, but, and the, the code underneath that is going to shrink because we can pull out a lot of this stuff, but it's also going to become potentially less readable. So I think, yeah, the, the, it, it's our job, and um, it's definitely our responsibility to make sure that that's being well documented um, if we keep moving in this direction. But yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Other questions? Or I mean, or, or other things that you would like? If I, was, if, I, if I was working for you and I said, hey, I'm gonna do this to our library, what would you, what would you say in response? Yeah. Right, right. I am, I am technically a CATS contributor, so I have, I have some say here. Um, but yeah, I, th I, th and I think they're a pretty reasonable group. So um, yeah, that, that's also a concern, though. So we are turning over some of our power over API or over the design of our library to a third party, and we might not always get the things we want. Um, this is actually one of the reasons that Twitter hasn't ever used Scala Z. It's because Scala Z team just, we don't care about performance, we care about correctness, we care about functional purity. Um, we really needed performance changes, and so um, in a couple of Twitter libraries, we've implemented our own version of Monad, plug functor, things like that. Yeah, but it's, it's a good point. Yes? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, so this is something that, that I, I feel like the, the community around Shapeless, um, which overlaps a lot with the community around CATS, um, is, is um, uh, converging on a, a so yeah, the, the, the issue is that you're likely, if you're using these kinds of libraries, to pull in a Shapeless dependency from somewhere else, and then if you have to worry about keeping that in sync with, with, Cat, with Finch's Shapeless dependency, it can be really painful. Um, so yeah, I think that this, in this case, the responsibility is on the community to um, keep versions up to date, and that sucks. Yeah. But the new binder trees are gonna solve exactly the problem. The new what? <laughs> the trees which weren't introduced. Oh right, right. Solve exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> when is this coming? Is that what? Uh, that's shapeless three uh, or Scala yeah, three point uh, Trees which weren't introduced at the Verizon meetup uh, before Scala days. Okay. So it's gonna be an additional layer. Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, yes? Uh, there's a lot of stuff in Shapeless, and you're only using the reader or something. That's the kind of library baggage that you're 
Yeah, this is another good point. So this is something that, that Miles, um, the, the leader of the Shapeless Project, has been, he's been pushing for um, a, a, more, uh, a more modular Shapeless 3.0. So um, it's, it's not a huge dependency to start with, and we are using quite a bit of it. But yeah, we're not using right now at least um, uh, the, the s statically sized, oh, do you mind logging yourself back in, sorry. Um, the statically sized collections. There are a lot of parts of Shapeless that we're not currently using. Um, but yeah, that will get better. So Shapeless 2.0 is on um, its, uh, one of its later release candidates now. And um, I think that the next, the, the plan is to move on to Shapeless 3.0 pretty quickly after that. Um, but yeah, a more modular, so CATS is, one, this is another thing that I should actually put in the slides. So one of the differences between CATS and Scala Z is CATS is much more modular. So you have a core module that only includes the core type classes and a few data types. And then, and then all of the standard library instances are in a separate module. All the other, the pieces like um, the free monad stuff, all of that is in, in separate modules. So that's the direction that CATS has been going from the beginning in contrast to Scala's head, and that's the direction that Shapeless is moving. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I'd be interested in seeing is uh, say separating the router functionality as its own separate library. One of the mm -hmm. frustrating things about working and trying to choose between different HTTP right. frameworks is right. that router DSLs are propagating like Know, one every weekend. Yeah. And it would be great to have a standard way of defining a route to, say, a service interface that's generic and separate from an underlying implementation. Yeah. I, and I think the, what you're describing sounds like the probably the better route to, well, so to speak, to get there. No, I, I definitely. Th um, so are you thinking of this as, as even more generic than that it's not? Finagle specific or right. okay, right? Yeah. So so right now we've got this P request type in in the current version of of um, of Finch and also in whatever Cat's version of Finch there will be. And the P request type is not Finagle specific, but as soon as we fix it, as soon as we fix that input type to HTTP request, then it becomes Finagle specific. Um, yeah, it also returns Twitter future. So those are the two. So yeah, um, if you don't fix that first argument, you still have a Twitter util dependency. I think that it gets really difficult to have something that's both generic and that if we throw, yeah, if we move away from the, from the, tw from the tw I can imagine having a nice router li generic router library that doesn't have the finagle dependency, um, but you really need something like, I guess you could do this, the Scala standard library futures, but then you're in a different, um, a different set of interoperability problems, but yeah. Um, okay, I guess I, I kind of got derailed into questions there when I was still going through. So most of these things we mentioned already, um, except performance. So this is something that didn't come up. Uh, so um, what is the performance impact of these, these kinds of operations? Anybody have any guesses? Um, yeah. Well, I guess the uh, boilerplate stuff in shape was always computation. Right, so right. So if you concatenate tuples, you create two H lists, then you concatenate the H lists, then you copy the tuple again. Right, so yeah. So you might get all the garbage there. Yeah, you, you, will, you will do a lot more allocation when you're using shapeless. Um, that's not as much of a, so w the way that we're using shapeless is actually a pretty, it's pretty much a drop in replacement for that tilde type, which is basically like a kind of H list itself. So there, I, we didn't add, at least we didn't massively add allocations when we switched from tilde to hlist. Um, I, we haven't actually benchmarked this yet, but um, it's, it's a pretty small change so far, and I think it will, we should benchmark it sooner rather than later. Um, uh, but yeah, in that case, it is just a drop in of um, hlist for tilde, so you're not going to see massive differences. Um, but yeah, uh, one of the nice things about Shapeless is that you do have these type class instances that do float around at runtime, but all of the type class instance resolution happens at compile time. So, so most of the complex computation that Shapeless is doing is happening at compile time. Uh, have you observed issues with uh, polymorphic dispatch on the uh, type class instances? 
Just like Scala has issues with functions now, maybe yeah. maybe in Scala days the talk they had about right. As soon as you have three different instances of function, everything becomes terribly slow. I don't really know. I don't. I don't know if I've seen a good, good examination of of that issue in Shapeless. But yeah, it's a good point. Um, uh, so just as uh, one thing that we have benchmarked, so there's a kind of sister project to Finch. It's much less well developed. It's something that Vladimir and I um, put together during Hack Week at Twitter in January. The second uh, link here, Finagle Serial. So Finagle Serial is basically trying to do what Finch does for HTTP services for binary services. So instead of, um, instead of IDL-based um, uh, binary services, you have um, binary services that are built on top of the S codec um, binary serialization library, um, which is a type class um, uh, serialization library. So, and in Finch, we have actually done benchmarks of, or I'm sorry, in Finagle Serial of um, Finagle Serial services versus um, thrift services on Finagle, and you get about half the throughput. So you are paying a price, but you're, um, you're getting a massively simpler build process and API. Um, and I'd encourage you to take a look at Finagle Serial. Um, it is, it's, it, as far as I know, nobody's using it in production or anything like production, um, but it is a, a really interesting little project that allows you to write Finagle services that you can actually use um, in a real world way in four or five lines of code. Um, okay, so yeah, that's the closest thing that we have to have in it. And because it's built on S codec, it's also built on Shapeless. Um, so I would imagine that in the case of Finch, you don't see, so if you're taking just a pure Finagle HTTP service and comparing it to a Finch service, you're not going to see anywhere near that, that um, like half the throughput slow down um, because there's much less wrapper going on. Um, but yeah, there is a, there is a runtime cost. Ah. Okay, um, I guess we can go ahead and, I think that was my last slide, yeah. Um, other questions? Uh, I guess I could pass this around. Yes, Alexi. Just out of curiosity, everything is under Finagle, but Finatra is under Twitter. <laughs> yeah, so why is that? that's a really good question. So the reason is, um, the, uh, is because almost everything under the Twitter organization on GitHub um, lives in our internal mono repo and is, and is synced out to GitHub. Um, and the things under the Finagle organization um, live primarily on GitHub. And um, if they're used internally, they're synced internally. So it's, a, it's just a, it's a matter of which direction things are going, whether they're, they're going um, from the mono repo out and then being synced back in, or whether they primarily live on GitHub and are occasionally synced internally. Does that, yeah, it's something that could be better articulated in. Um, uh, Any questions? Okay, so is this, wait, just, is this a vote of confidence? Should we continue in this direction uh, with shapeless integration cats? Does anybody, if you were going to use Finch before and you saw this presentation, are you like, no, I'm not going to use Finch now, or, yes? I'm sorry? Oh, awesome, okay, great, thanks, yes. This would replace the micro. Micro's on its way out anyway. So this, this, this like, is a super set of the problem that micro is trying to solve. Um, yeah, so the, the idea of, um, so, so one, yeah, I'm sorry to, um, the, now we're actually treating request reader directly as a, Cli as a Cliesley arrow and finagle services are Cliesley arrows and, and this whole like micro is one attempt to do this kind of unification and we get that unification for free if we go the cat's route. It's further in the future and micro will go away before that. I think micro has already been deprecated, yes. right? Yeah, yes. um, but, it, but it's, 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 a, it's an attempt along a different angle towards the same general goal. Is that right? Sound right, Father? Yes, right. right. Uh, this micro is trying to solve the problem of um, composing the routers of different types. So you have an implicit conversion from something to, to HTTP response, so you can compile them together. And an implicit conversion applied in compile time. And I believe heterogeneous routers is something that is going to replace micro right now. Yeah. Yeah, so keep an eye open for the work um, that should be coming up in the next week on the heterogeneous routers. Yes. Have you talked to your adopters about uh, the people who are actually running Finch in production, how they feel about 
having categories slip into their yes. API? Yes. Um, so mo most of these people right now are either in this room or on the Gitter channel pretty consistently. So yeah, um, all of this stuff is being run past the people who are currently using Finch in production. Um, very positive as far as I've seen. I don't live in the Gitter channel all the time, but um, Vladimir, does that seem? Uh, yes, um, I think as long as we try to keep the API right. changed, people just won't notice any difference. Right. Yeah. They um, used Flatmap before, and they even use Flatmap with cats. There's no main difference. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, even here we have people who are just, they see scholars that they just run the Right. Direction. Yeah. Uh, and again, like you won't even have to, unless you dig into the code base, you will never see the word Clisely. Um, because we have this type alias, which is p request reader, and it behaves exactly the same as um, as our old p request reader. It's just it's implemented um, in cats as a Clisley arrow. Um, so yeah, the the actual things that people will see if they dig down, it gets scary, but um, you don't have to get that far. And this is modeled, so we're really inspired by the S codec um, uh, API, which is just really beautiful and built on on Shapeless, and you never have to see see Shapeless. Um, unless you do dig down into the code. Lots of people are using it happily um, without being shapeless experts. So yeah, we want to stay pretty close to that ideal. OK. OK, I'm done. Sorry. Thanks.